Good morning. Buenos dias. Good morning. Is anybody going to talk to me? <laughs> Thank you so much for being here this morning. You're early risers, and, I, and we all appreciate it. Um, today, we're going to talk about the future of work and education. Uh, so let me ask you first, how many of you have a job? How many of you have a job that is uh, full-time? How many of you have a job that is uh, consulting or a gig kind of job? How many of you work for uh, the private sector? And how many of you work for government? And are, is there anyone here that wants to say they don't have a job? You know, this is a good place to come and find a job. OK, well, I'm glad you're all employed. This is important. And will you be employed in the future? Do, it, we don't know, do we? So I think the, the interesting thing about this session today is really about the future and how we are going to gauge how we're going to measure our success, our quality of life, and our work life. So I want to, um, I, I want to show you this cover. This is a paper that I'm releasing uh, probably in, in the next month. It's about rethinking, reimagining, redesigning global urbanization and really understanding what are the hard questions to ask, what are the, what are the difficult areas that we should be studying to really understand what to do with the future, how to take bigger, bolder action. So the reason I show you this is because I think this is the key in our sessions today. What are the hard questions? And um, these are the ones that uh, came to my mind when I was doing research for this issue. But I think uh, you'll hear a lot, of, a lot of interest about alignment, about uh, disruption, about the changing world of work and education. And it's moving so fast, most of us can't even keep up with it. But just looking at some of these questions, how fluid will work become? Will we move from one project to the next? Will we stay in a job for more than two years? How many of you have been in your job for more than two years? More than six years? More than 10 years? Wow. So a lot of people are moving very quickly uh, from one job to the next, one, one uh, promotion to the next in some ways. Um, will we need to meet in person? Do we need to have face-to-face -face communication? How many of you live, I mean, how many of you work in an office where you meet with the same people every day? And how many of you work remotely? So do you need to meet in person? Do you need to have that face-to-face -face communication? Will the world of work change entirely going forward? Um, what about new skills? What new skills are you in a job right now where you get professional development, where you have skills and training on a regular basis? Oh, not many of you. Yeah. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to be prepared for a future where new skills are required? How many of you know how to do coding? Yeah, well, there are not enough 20-somethings in the audience, are there? <laughs> Uh, but I, I think these are questions, these are really important questions. And finally, how will we prepare for a very different future? Things are changing. How many of you noticed that the world of work has changed already? Where you live, where you work, where you co-create? Yeah, it's, it's all around us. So it is my pleasure. Um, uh, oh, this is, this is the plan for today, hello. Um, we're going to have two keynote presentations, and then we're going to take a little break, and we're going to have a great panel discussion. Um, and I want to, it's now my pleasure to introduce Victor Mulas. Victor is uh, with the World Bank, and he is doing incredible things with uh, research and um, looking at disruption and how the world of work is going to change for us and how do we prepare for it. So I think um, it, it'll be very thought provoking. The idea here is that, you, that uh, Victor will speak for about 15 minutes and then have time for your questions. And the trick is, for you to ask the questions. You know, the smartest people in the room are in the audience. So we're counting on you to ask the hard questions. And please now welcome Victor Mulas. So while we 
while we wait for the presentation to load, um, I just, I'm going to talk about a little bit more than future work. I wanted to talk a little bit more about the future of cities and how cities are changing or not with these new dynamics that we are seeing um, due to technology. Um, is ready? Um, so basically, my job uh, relates to disruption that is generated by technology. We look at how the technology is changing the way we work, the way we live, the way we operate socially, uh, and how we integrate ourselves in society, and how these things are changing because of technology, it's changing those dynamics. And what is the impact of that for economic development, and for personal development, and social development? We work in developing countries. We are an organization that works in the whole world uh, of development. We work in Asia, Latin America, in Africa, in the Middle East. So we have a great view of how this change is affecting everyone. So this is just to give you the little bit of background of where this is coming from. Let me just start by the, starting with the presentation. So the topic is the future of work, but I want to relate it to cities a little bit. Um, the first thing you're going to see here is I'm going to talk a lot about data because at the end we are the World Bank, we are all about data. We, we have a lot of economists, so we are a little bit geek with data. Um, but it's just to give you like a sense of where we are. You have two graphs here. This is basically something you already know. The economy is changing. And it's changing into what we call intangibles. The value of the economy is going from something tangible, something that we used to make and touch, to something intangible. That is the digital stuff, right? And what you see in the first graphic, in the right, is the orange line is the value of goods, the value in the economy uh, of physical goods on trade. And what you're saying is that value is going down, right? It's stabilizing and going down. So no matter how many things we make, the value is not going up. Actually, it's going down. And the other line, the blue one, is digital flows, which is a proxy that we are using for what is the value of things that are intangible, that are digital, that are just something you send in an email or you make in a document ideas, and that is going up big time. Add 3D printing, 4D printing, and you start having like, you just send the goods to be printed in the next location. So that value of intangibles is going to go up more and more and more, and the tangibles are going to go down. Um, this is happening in industries. The second uh, slide that you have there is about how the value of this tangible and intangible is growing in different sectors. And what we know is that it's universal. It's happening in, in every sector. Uh, it's in manufacturing, it's in IT services, it's also in automobile everywhere. Just think about the transformation that is happening in, in the automobile sector and in cars. Right now, you buy a car, it's something tangible. And to buy that car, there have been a lot of people making that car, making little pieces, and an assembly line, and a lot of small SMEs that are the supply chains of that going from the wheels to the brakes to the little pieces. That's a lot of jobs that were there, right? Now, think what's going to happen when it becomes self-driving car. The value of that car is going to be the software of that car that you can update every day. And the car in itself is going to be just a chassis. So think about what happened with the PC industry. At the beginning, with, when we started with the PC, the value was on these mega frames. Remember the rooms with the big uh, uh, wheels that were there, IBM was all about value of these PCs, and it was all about physical things. The Microsoft came, all the value went to software. Right now, you buy a PC, and the manufacturer of the PC gets very little. It's a commodity. All the value is in software. That's going to happen in cars. And when that happens in cars, what happens with all the supply chains and all the workers that are doing that? Think about it. It will go to the software. So this is basically what this slide is telling you. We are having this transformation in value, which will make people to change how they work and how they produce things. The next slide is just to tell you, yes, it's about change in the work, but it's also in the way we live. Um, on the right side, you have a little bit, uh, this is from the World Economic Forum, but basically that was an analysis of what kind of jobs are in more demand and what kind of jobs are in less demand. So this is basically the story I just told you. If you're in manufacturing just doing things, and you are doing repetitive and routine things, those jobs are disappearing. And the ones that are growing are the ones that it's about ideas, it's about creativity, it's about managing people, social interaction. 
The second uh, graph that you have is a little bit more about the way we live, that is also changing. And you all know that because you have cell phones, and now you look at Google Maps when you go to a direction, you text your friends just to meet them, and you find them. When I grew up, I, didn't, I couldn't text my friends. I had to find them in a location, and we were waiting for them, and it was more difficult. These things make our life changing. But this, this graph is very interesting because it's about how we meet with each other. How do we find a partner, a husband, a wife, or a partner? And what you can see in the red line, that is people that met online. Okay? The others were the traditional ways of meeting people, through a coworker, a friend, through family, whatever it was. Look at online, what is happening. We are all meeting online now. This is changing the way we interact with each other. We now swipe <laughs> instead of talking, right? So this is how our behavior is also changing, our social dynamics. Um, so all these things are happening not in a vacuum, are happening in a tangible way. And the place where we are seeing this the most is in cities. And the reason for that is because cities is where the humans get together. You know, we have the agglomeration of people. And we are seeing this in data with economic dynamics. The cities are getting more and more part of the economic dynamics. Urbanization is growing very, very, very fast. And it's a big divide between urban and rural because all the economy uh, value is going to the cities. And what is more important is the intangible economy is moving to the cities. Why? Because that's where the ideas are. That's where the creativity is. That's where I can interact with someone like Tomas and then find him and get ideas from him because he is in a city with other people. That's where I can find you guys here and you can come and we can have a dialogue. Right? You cannot do that in a rural area <laughs> because usually it doesn't happen. And what is happening is that the intangible kind of value is moving into cities, and you are seeing that, for instance, in startups, technology startups, which are the ones that are developing the new businesses. And this is just a map of where the VC industry, which is the capital that is invested in future businesses, in startups, is locating around the world. And you can see that it's uh, in different cities. Now, one issue that we have is it is not happening at the same fashion in all the world. There are The north is still getting the the bulk of it, you have developing countries that still need to attract more of those capital and that kind of creative talent. So that's one thing that we still need to work on. Um, and we have to be sure that this change into the intangible economy can be a shared prosperity for the whole world. But I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. That same situation we have in cities, because cities is where people live and community with each other is where the jobs are. But what I'm going to tell you about these two graphs that look like uh, the 1990s Microsoft Dynamics, yes. But there is a reason for that. Um, these graphs are about Nairobi. And what we are looking here is, it's great you are in a city because you can meet with other people, but it's not the same for everyone because you rely a lot in two things. First, education and access to education. If you don't have the right education, it's very difficult for you to access a good job opportunity or access a meeting because you don't have that education. So access to schools is very important. And now that the economy is going into intangibles, access to the economic opportunities that are online is also important. If you don't know how to code, you cannot access coding jobs, right? So how do we provide that education to uh, people with low income? And the second part is how, do, how these people get into the education, into the, the schools, but also the jobs. So when you go to different cities around the world, the transport network and the, the transport infrastructure is not the same as here in Barcelona. You here, you can take a metro and you can go around the city. In one hour, you can cover the whole city. You go to Nairobi and that's not the case. They don't have that infrastructure. So if um, we look at, uh, for instance, how people access their jobs in, in, a, in a city like Nairobi, and most of them go walking or use the matatu, which are the informal buses. If you look at it, 70% of the population either walk or uses matatu to go to work. The plots here are telling you how many jobs they can access within one hour using the, the public bus. That's the second uh, graph, the red one. And what you can see is like they can only access 20% of jobs. Most of them are in the red area. They cannot, access, they, they, they cannot access the jobs. They are all stuck because of the congestion. If you have a car and you're privileged enough, you can access much more. That's the, the right side. So how do we work thinking about this inequality 
and this infrastructure into providing access to these jobs opportunities and access to education to everyone within the city. So they can leverage these agglomeration effects that are happening in each of the cities. So, and the reason for that is because talent is going to be the most important asset for the cities, and especially for city competitiveness. And that talent is going to be the creative talent, and the one that is educated to understand these new opportunities in the intangible economy. So you have here two graphs. The first one is from Richard Florida uh, analysis, and it's about what he calls the creative class, which is all the people that have the education to actually access uh, these intangible economy opportunities. They can be entrepreneurs, they can code, they can be creators, they can develop something new and create teams and move very fast. That's kind of the startup economy and the creative economy and the digital economy. And interestingly enough, in the US, Washington DC is the one that has the most. <laughs> um, but then you have Seattle, San Francisco, you can see that. Who doesn't have that? Detroit, Milwaukee. So you can see that it's started to be a divide. This is happening in all of your countries. This is not only in the US, it's just we don't have data, but you can, you can see the divide between cities. The second graph is, is not only about you as a city creating that talent and being available for the opportunities that are there, it's also that talent attracts other economic opportunities. And this is, for instance, how Google is looking for talent around the world. They create these Google campuses which is basically to develop the startup ecosystem in a city outside the United States, because then they can find that in that ecosystem talent that they will hire. <laughs> because it's very, it's, that's the recruiting system that they do. Why? Because they compete globally for the best talent in the world. They compete against Amazon, against Alibaba, very few of them with the best technology talent of the world. So you can see which cities are they going to. They go into Warsaw, they go into Seoul, they go into Tel Aviv, they go into London. Why? Because that's where the creative talent is, the educated talent is. And this is a vicious cycle. You create the talent, then these companies come, you create more talent, and then those cities will lead over the rest, and you will have that. Um, so how can you do as a city official to go and be in that class uh, and share the, the prosperity with these cities? Um, so there are different things that are happening in cities. The first one is by themselves, they are, they are adapting to these disruptions and this transformation. And what we are seeing is many cities are already developing co-working spaces instead of offices. They have co-living spaces you can live into that. And they have other community spaces that are starting to interact, the public and the private. We no longer have offices that are only offices by themselves. We want them to be sharing in, in a neighborhood with places that you live, where you have uh, amenities, then you have parks, and things like that. And many cities are reacting to that. Brooklyn is an example of that. Complete transformation of an industrial area into a startup town, where most of it is co-working, co-living, right? Um, so we will have more of this transformation happening, and the question is, as a city official, can you adapt to that and leverage that transformation to attract more creative people? Or if you don't do anything, are you blocking the creative uh, talent to be in your city. And the thing is that these technology trends are going to increase. Now, this is just an image of a luminescent tree, which is one of these new technologies that uh, may come into the cities. Basically, you can take out all the, traffic, all, all the lights of the city uh, at night, the, even the LED, and you can use trees, but because we are going to use the firefly genes to put it into the trees, so they at night <laughs> illuminate themselves. CO2 emissions reduced. <laughs> you even have a positive CO2 emissions because the trees are there, generating more, and less energy consumption. This is possible. This has already been tested. But this is just to tell you, there are going to be many of these happening, and they are going to change how we live, how the street is, how we operate. Think about retailing. Now retailing is Amazon is the new retailing, right? And it's eliminating the old bookstores. What is Amazon? It's just for you to go there and see something and order online. It's depressing bookstore, by the way, because I love bookstores. But it's just a different way of doing things. It's just a showroom. And if that's happening and you have delivery that is uh, online to instead of restaurants, how is this is going to change the dynamics of the cities? So all these trends are happening. It's going very rapidly. And we have to start making decisions into how do we leverage all this in a positive way. And that's important because 
we can end up in a scenario A or a scenario B. And we can end up in a very doomsday scenario. We don't leverage it very well. And we can all get upset with each other because there are less and less economic opportunities. And then conflict emerges. And then we continue just taking the resources that are there for us only and not to share. And we ended up polluting even more. Or we can go into the idyllic place where everybody is happy, the environment is with us, and we use the technology to actually connect and develop more economic opportunities for all of us. But that's not simple. That's easy to say and visualize here. But if you're a city official, it's very difficult. So how do you do this? So one of the things we are starting to work is what we call uh, foresight uh, analysis to understand all these disruptive technologies, uh, forces that are happening, and how they are changing the dynamics, the social dynamics, the world dynamics, and the living dynamics in the city, and how that's affecting planning and thinking as a city. So you can think about infrastructure in a different way. You can leverage the uncertainties and start thinking, how can you plan for a 20, 30 years plan of infrastructure in a flexible way that can help attracting that creative talent at the same time? How do you make a more livable city and you don't get stuck with streets that are thought for 10 years ago, right? And that's something we are starting to think with cities like Singapore, which are very close to a scenario, idyllic scenario, except for the, the part that you cannot chew gum, but <laughs> the rest is there. And this is something that we look more and more into measures for more smart decision thinking. So the point is, start thinking about all these disruptive trends, embed them in the planning decision in any uh, uh, way of operating uh, for designing the new streets uh, and the new city that you have, and think more social. Think about how this interaction can happen and develop more creative talent. Um, but this is not going to be enough. The other part is how do you bring economic opportunities for all of them, sorry, uh, education opportunities for all of the new generations to start thinking this other way, to start thinking more creative. And this is something that the following panel is going to talk about. And I leave it here because it's not only about the, the planning from the top down, from the city officials, it's also about developing this new demand of skills that are going to come. Thank you very much. There you go. Is that mic in the center working? OK. Good morning. Hi. My name is Soledad. I'm from Argentina. And I was looking at the map that you showed where uh, you mentioned that BC venture capitals are still growing in central cities in the North Hemisphere. I yeah. was, was wondering if you have any thoughts about what can cities, what can be done at the city level to attract this capital these capitals in the South Hemisphere. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You want to take more or one by one? We'll just do a few. OK. Uh, so there's a lot of things you can do. <laughs> the easy answer is uh, it will take me too much time, but just to summarize. That's just part of my job. I, I work with cities to develop what we call startup ecosystems, which at the end is the conditions to be able to create these startups that are going to develop new businesses yeah, that don't exist. So think about it. In the intangible economy right now, we are hitting some technologies that are opening new universes of businesses that don't exist. Think about blockchain or AI. Five years ago, there was no business whatsoever about blockchains. And now you're having so many new companies that are generating new employment, right? Um, so how do you develop that talent and retain that talent? And we have to work with education, and you have to work with um, intermediaries like accelerators and mentors, and you have to bring talent to, to, to create that. But when you do that, and you do it very well, like in Argentina, because you have a lot of that talent in Buenos Aires and Rosario, uh, excellent education, excellent technology education, excellent, excellent creativity, a lot of creative thinking and, 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 and uh, talent, but also the culture and endowment there. And then they leave because the money is not there, and the enabling environment is not there. Right? So one thing is, how do you start creating these VCs locally to avoid that these guys leave and go to London or go to the US and develop the companies there, and they don't come back? And 
one of the main problems is investing in real estate in many of these countries it has more returns than investing in a startup, so that forces a, a difficulty. You can change that by catalyzing, catalyzing those funds with public funding. There are some policies to, to start uh, matching funds or creating funds that will invest uh, and attract uh, some, some uh, foreign investors together with what you're doing. Um, but primarily, it's also, can you give returns enough for that to happen uh, for the local investors or the international investors? And can you leverage the public sector to uh, ameliorate the risk? So you can attract and catalyze all this funding that happen. Um, there are some examples of countries that have done it. Colombia is one of them that you want to, to see. That is little by little creating that. And I can tell you much more about it in, in a little bit. Another question? Uh, maybe you want to. Hello. First of all, thank you for everything. I came here to learn, but still there are some questions that are main. <laughs> and it's all related to your conception of the creative talent, which, I mean, I'm not sure I've understood it completely, but I believe there are different talents in our society. And when you express like the, the, the percentage of uh, creative talent in different cities in the, in the US, Yes. I understand yeah. this is like the distribution of the kind of talents in the city. It doesn't mean, I mean, it can happen that in Las Vegas there is a lot of talent, but it's just like uh, they are minority compared to other kinds of talent. So my question is like, I, I'm really aware like a city of Barcelona has to be concerned about attracting this kind of creative talent that we need to develop our startup ecosystem. But is it necessary like this to be a majority? Isn't it better to have like, a, equality distribution of different kinds of talent. So we also can have people that can uh, work with the land or work with, uh, I don't know, another kind of jobs. Mm -hmm. Because it seems like after your explanation that the best thing for everyone is like to have 90% of people with create of this kind of talent you're talking about. I think you can do creative things with, with hands also. So uh, I don't know, maybe I misunderstood you at some point. <laughs> No, no, not at all. So when this is uh, from Richard Florida uh, analysis, uh, he called it uh, creative talent to uh, any, uh, any talent that have the skills uh, to work in what he calls the creative economy. That goes from being an entrepreneur, being able to understand how do you de develop a business from scratch and are able to, to conduct it, uh, being a manager, being able to interact with people, um, being a, a, a lawyer, a service economy, a consultant, uh, a bank is something that is working in the non-routine jobs, okay? Think about anything that has to do with the 21st century skills, critical thinking, teamwork, uh, all these other problem solving abilities, all these kind of abilities. Like caring skills? skills are social skills, okay? So that's it, but this is not in, in this part. And I'll tell you about caring skills in a little bit. So this is thinking about the, if you want productive uh, talent to create creative economy uh, assets, right? And the reason these are important is because that is where the value of the economy is going towards, right? Um, so you're right, you don't have to have 90% of this. But if you don't have enough of this, you will not create value to create jobs for the rest. Uh, you need to look for the other talent that is the social talent, that's another one that you may want to have because that's, those jobs will, will continue to be there. But those usually don't multiply, uh, don't have a multiplier effect in terms of creating other jobs. Right? They are in the part of receiving jobs, not creating the job. The manager of the hospital is the one that creates more jobs and can expand it and blah, blah, blah. Uh, or the marketing people or whatever it is. Right? So that's where you have the balance. Now the question is going to be for you as a, uh, as a city, I, I don't recommend you to do a planning on percentages of things <laughs> because that hasn't worked very well in the past. <laughs> um, but what you're going to see is the dynamics are going into, right now we have a mix of manufacturing being X percent of the, of the jobs and the value and everything and uh, services being less. You're going to see it's like most of it going to services. So the question is, 
I, can, I cannot give you 90%, I cannot give you anything. What you're going to see is if you want to adapt to the new economy, that's where the jobs are. Otherwise, you're going to end up in an unemployment. So it's not about I have people in the, in the farm versus no, you have unemployed versus employed. And that's going to be your mix. So it's about reskilling and providing those abilities for the people to actually access those opportunities. And I have to stop because they were like telling me. Thank you. Thank you. Will you stay around a bit for yeah, some yeah, questions? I'll be in here. case other people have questions for Victor, he'll be here a little bit longer. By the way, I happen to live in Washington, D.C., and I can vouch for its creative uh, politics. So uh, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's my pleasure now to introduce Lina Galvez Munoz. She is a, a former university professor, but now a member of the European Parliament. So that's, I'm very impressed with that. I'm not even sure what that means. But uh, she, her background is very impressive for this particular session today. She is uh, doing, focused on research in industry and energy. She's also a member of the Women's Committee on Employment. So I think uh, you'll have a lot of interesting things to tell us and give us hope for the future. Please welcome Lina Galvez Munoz. Well, I will sit down and I will not have um, a presentation. I will just talk. Hello, um, because I talk a lot, probably now, so why I end up in politics. And uh, so when I uh, use a presentation, I tend to talk even more because I, as a professor, I stop for explaining every single one. So I decided as um, much with that. So um, I was thinking to make a very sort of small presentation, but uh, many of the things I wanted to say has already been said. Um, so how different the world will be and is already been with this um, um, digital revolution, this new industrial re revolution. But I wanted to say also very much related to job because you asked me to be optimistic that if we look to the past, maybe we could learn a few lessons too. Um, um, I, well, I used to be, I'm still economic history professor so this is not the first time we have a big um, uh, technological disrupt. It's not the first time we have uh, an industrial revolution. The, the, the different things is now is the, the path is, is, is much faster than any time before. But also before, the, there were huge changes in the way we lived, in the way we work, in everything, absolutely, absolutely everything. And it is true that it was uh, um, a lot of job losses, but a lot of job, job creation at the same time. So if you look to the, to the sort of the new result, is, it was a positive result. But it doesn't mean that a lot of people lose their job, the way they were living, and the, the, the impact was very unequal. And it, it is now, as it had been just shown, very, very unequal because there were regions that were, you know, almost disappearing, the population that was living there, there were other regions going up. So a lot of difference. Uh, also among people and uh, uh, among different territories and uh, also uh, regarding gender, I will deal with that too. Because now also we will have to face big inequalities regarding gender on this uh, uh, disruption. So, so I'm relative optimist on, on, on that, but I, uh, I just wanted to, 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 to stress this inequality because I think it's the big challenge. It's our big challenge. If we want a good outcome of that or we'll go for a bad outcome. Because inequality doesn't go very well with democracy. And that's another thing we have to, to know about it. Mm -hmm. If we want to, to keep also the good things of our uh, ongoing um, um, life. And we have, because we have to say that this um, um, digital revolution, this uh, um, big disrupt is happening also in, uh, within a neoliberal revolution that has changed many things uh, in the economy, in the in politics and also in our culture as individuals. I mean, we are sort of, uh, um, we think more in an, on an individual way and in fact the results, or the, so, sorry, the receipts 
are more sort of kind of individual. I mean, this skills is good to have uh, skills, to prepare for a skill, to reskill. Everything is perfect because we, we have to do it, but we cannot have the whole responsibility. And everything is up to us. You have to, to be an entrepreneur, you have to reskill, you have to do whatever, you have to be everything. But at the end, it's your own responsibility, which is good. I mean, we are human beings, we, we have our sovereignty and everything and so forth, but things are not that easy, in my opinion, especially when looking to uh, all these inequalities because we don't have the same opportunities and we don't have the same freedom to choose. And this is important because everything is based on this idea that we are choosing um, because we are doing free choice. But it's not true because our, we have different prematerial conditions. We have a different socialization and that in terms of gender is very important because we are socialized for caring and we do much more than men do. Even if we are incorporated on the labor market, we still do in this country one hour per day more on unpaid care work than men. So we have one hour less to prepare for skills, to be entrepreneurs, whatever, for instance. And also we adapt to the um, real opportunities we have. So if we, we say well, it's impossible for me to arrive there, so I, I change my expectations. So we don't have this kind of freedom. So that's a thing. And, but, but the culture we are now, this new real revolution that is also cultural, is saying to us that we have this kind of free choice. But this is, yes, but not that much. So just moving because um, um, uh, uh, this is almost, I have uh, 15 minutes? No, no, sorry. It's uh, the time there. And so moving to what we need um, uh, to adapt and to anticipate to, to answer to the, all these changes. So I think we need, of course, as you mentioned, uh, to think about the skills, to think about education, but we also think we need to think also other, uh, obviously, innovation uh, research policies, but also uh, uh, um, policies that uh, kind of uh, thinking on, on the transitions to that world for not leaving anyone, anyone or any territory behind. This is important and we have to think also on this transition policies. But also at, uh, at the end, if I have time, I would like to say that we have to also to think on changing the rules of the game. Because otherwise, we will not um, make that transition in a way that works for everyone, in an inclusive way. So um, as skills, well, we know already, the, we, in, many, in, in, in many countries we lack skills. You said Google is going to other places, opening this place. Obviously, there will be many countries saying where this will be a brain drain because we will never, you know, develop in a way because they will take in. Or uh, these companies are going to, to wonderful places for a startup like Israel, Tel Aviv. But now, um, because they are paying higher wages, they are uh, killing this uh, startup system, that very nice, a good uh, startup system, because and now there is a huge shortage of skill, people on, on STEAM, engineering, and all these uh, uh, sort of things. So we need to reskilling, we need to upskilling. And uh, at the European Union level, we have also a, a shortage of, 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 of skills. And, of course, the, 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 the European Union and the different um, mem um, country members are working, on, uh, are working on that, although there are a lot of internal uh, differences too, and for instance, Eastern European countries are complaining all the time about this brain drain. So it's, uh, this, this shortage of, of skills is, uh, is again very, um, very unequal. Um, uh, for instance, and, uh, for instance, regarding you asked about the, the different skills and, and gender, if I, um, for instance, we have uh, a, a shortage of women on STEAM um, industries, um, especially because of the way we are socialized, and so we have to do a lot of work also on education, and we will uh, try to, to, to work on that. But still, this is not decreasing, but increasing in a in a in a in a way 
And so what we could have here is that the, these very good jobs, very good paid jobs, uh, will be occupied by men. So they will be the ones also um, designing the algorithm and all of that. So with a male bias, very clear, and also in a way uh, uh, to see what is, uh, which, which skills are good or not, will be biased by the people who are in power, also in the power of creating the algorithm. So that could be very, um, very terrible for advancing on gender equality, because as um, because Victor said before, it's true that there are um, this all this work because um, I wrote a long time ago an article say uh, robots can take care of us, but they don't care about us. Okay, so uh, and because. When doing care, can be in education, health, uh, direct care, whatever, you, this personal relationship, this humanity, it is still, is still important. So while they, they could care about us, they are creating this kind of robots and so forth, they will not take care about, uh, uh, about us. So jobs in these sectors will still be there. And these are very f female sectors. So, in a way, um, labor participation of women is not in danger, but maybe we will see an increase on pay gap because they will not be in these very high paid jobs. And if there is an increase in pay gap, probably they will start to stay more and more and more at home because say, well, if I will not get pay enough, probably it's not good to, to go because at the end someone has to do this care work, which is a lot. In total time, it's more than um, market work, okay? So it is important to see all these uh, inequalities and we have to, to, to face, as I said before. So education it is important for, for genders uh, specifically. Um, um, but not uh, not only we need it specifically not only to 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 um, to make a digital education uh, in order to have more people that will be able to um, to fill this this gap on on skills. We need also to educate uh, digitally uh, boys and girls to be able to understand that their rights, I don't want to get on, into that, but the rights are also in danger specifically for children. So we really need to, to, to educate that on that, um, on that uh, respect. But we also need to, 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 to develop skills and to educate on creativity, empathy, human contact, problem solving, collaboration, in the human side of humans, because it's where we will not be replaced by machines or robots. So this is, um, this is very important in that respect. But as, as I was saying um, before, uh, it is not enough on, um, um, you know, investing on, on skills. Uh, if someone is interested, I could tell you all the battery of programs that uh, the European Union is now developing uh, in order to, 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 to give an answer to this uh, short of a skill to this upskilling, to this reskilling from adult workers as well. So working in many different um, levels, uh, but also, as I say, in education, it is important also to, to, to think that that m might not be enough, especially for some sectors or some regions. When I say some sectors, is because normally there is a kind of regional specialization on different sectors. So, um, and uh, the digital transition is, the, is not the only transition we have to, um, to transit now, it's also the ecological one. And if we really would like, want to move, as uh, for instance in, in Europe we, we want to, uh, to do, there will be also a lot of regions that will stay without economic activity because they will decarbonize, etc. So, we really need to think on some transition funds. At the uh, European level, we have the Globalization Fund that was um, um, thought to add those workers and sectors that were um, 
beaten by uh, globalization because uh, um, uh, industries went, went everywhere. But now we have to think also on this, these two uh, transitions, sorry. Um, so that's something uh, that we have to do, and, and there are many, many, many things on, 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 on that. Uh, but, uh, and I'm finishing with that. Um, probably on that we have to think, I'm not very fan of it, but many people are proposing that probably we have to think on a basic income, we have to think on, instead of taxing um, uh, labor, we have to, to, to think on, on taxing these uh, renewal uh, uh, resources non-renewable resources, and, um, but on basic income, uh, well, maybe it's, it's a possibility, but not a gender good one possibility, because all the, um, the possible models regarding basic income are not having in account that there is this unequal um, uh, unpaid care work. So it is not the same thing that you say, you are giving a basic income to someone, uh, and that person obviously will not end up uh, work, will not finish, uh, stop working because it's probably is not enough. But what happens if you have another work, even if it's unpaid, which is the care work? So we could end up with uh, a huge divide. So that's something we, um, and l uh, just the, 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 as I said the, the, at the end, we have to, to think on, on changing uh, uh, our, our rules. Uh, maybe um, what we probably we have to change the way we think which is valuable which has value and which thing has no value and probably we need to be less addict to growth as we are and uh, maybe we really need to rethink economics and to rethink how we value things otherwise probably uh, we will end up with uh, a more unequal and not very nice uh, world after this digital revolution. Thank you. Who has questions for Lena? Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> Wait, let, let us get you a microphone. Oh, no, you want to walk to this microphone here? You don't. No, you don't want to walk. Okay. What the heck? Here you go. And tell us your name and where you're from. Oh, okay, so thank you, uh, Lina, for everything. Uh, my name is Almudena, I come from the government of Catalonia. Uh, I work in a program called Catalonia Prem, which is where, very aware of all this talent need and well, of this uh, transformation. So I wanted to just clarify, I mean, I totally <coughs> agree with uh, how you developed my question. I'm happy you did it. And, and I also agree with all the inequalities coming uh, in gender, but also like from uh, developing countries. I also feel like uh, it cannot be uh, possible for companies if they, they want to take profit, uh, that all the developers are from the, from the rich world because they are going to start developing apps and, and, and things for people in the other developing countries. So they'll need to include them in their teams. But uh, anyway, my question before about the um, caring is because I think we are also uh, about to have another transformation, which I don't know if it's a transformation, but is regarding aging. I think more and more people is going to be like very old. And it's okay, like when you're a developer, maybe you can be working until you are 70, but there comes a time that you need someone to take care of you. So if 90% uh, of the people who is uh, in your city is a developer, but no one knows how to take care of someone. And as you say, like machines are not going to be able to take care of us. We are going to have another problem. So I just think like sometimes when, when we uh, consider uh, these scenarios for the future, we also have to think about this, like who is going to take care of the children? Who is going to take care of the many old people? And maybe it's an egoist thought, but <laughs> yeah, I think we have to take care uh, of how we manage with this in the future. Should I? Quick. Very quick. Um, I, well, yes, and um, the, 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 the thing is that there are very different um, um, demographic realities in the world. So this aging is our um, demographic reality, but it is not other people's demographic reality. And we have to include here migration too. So many countries as this one is giving answer to that 
with uh, very low wages to migrant workers. And, um, but now there is also this um, um, xenophobia and everything. So we have also to make, to include that well. And we have to, to have in mind that um, the main people we will have to care are obviously in the future, at least in, in Europe, of all elder people. And the, the satisfaction that uh, it is uh, uh, linked to, to care when uh, is regarding children will not be there when, because one evolve and the other one, the contrary. So uh, we really just one minute and uh, so. But the thing is that we have to move toward a social transformation of uh, um, uh, a social organization of care, where care is not only a private issue. I have not um, included before because I didn't have much time, but we really need to think like a kind of a diamond of care. We have this, the, the public, we have this, the state, but the different, uh, the, com the um, municipality, <coughs> regions, whatever. We have the market, of, of course, but we have the family and we have the commons. We have the society. And there are a lot of initiatives, very, very good initiatives in, in the cities especially, that are really um, facing those, uh, those, those problems. So we have to, to think on a better understanding of these different four spaces of provisioning care and provisioning value. And uh, I think we have to, to rethink. One more question, one more quick question. I wonder, uh, I'm just curious about the audience. Oh, there you are, but before you ask, uh, how many of you feel like there's inequality in the workplace? And is it good for you or bad for you? Yeah. Yeah, we're seeing it already. Go ahead. Uh, you want to ask a question? You can come right here to the mic. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. I'm Hi. Padu Kalliokoski from city of Helsinki in Finland. And um, I'd like to ask you uh, what... Uh, what we should do about the skills of younger people, because for a long time we took uh, in Finland we took for granted that the younger generations are kind of digital natives and they uh, manage their way very well in those areas. But actually, recent studies show that the that the digital uh, skills of young people are diminishing. They are not uh, getting better all the time, and. Uh, uh, it's yet pretty unclear what is uh, what it's all about. Uh, whether the current situation with digital uh, gadgets is uh, kind of uh, not uh, so educating anymore. But uh, do you have any ideas or insights uh, how to deal with the diminishing digital uh, uh, skills of the younger people? So, well, you, I, I think the answer, you, you gave it already. Probably they, they, they were too much exposed from their early childhood to this um, digital, um, I mean, uh, phones and uh, tablets and uh, so, so on and so forth. So they, we need a, an education that it is not only digital because digital at the end is, 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 is it, there are images and they really need also to develop their imagination, which is less developed it's only with images. I'm not saying that it's bad. I'm not saying that. I, I, I'm saying just if it is very much just concentrated on that, there is a huge part that they're missing. And of course, it's, uh, so we really need, we need a balance. I think at, at the um, Silicon Valley, all these uh, very smart people are not educating their kids on on uh, digital at, at least from their early years. So, thank you so much, Lena. Thank Please, you. a round of applause. <laughs> uh, can you stick around for more questions if if the audience wants to ask? Great. Okay. So, guess what? We're, we're uh, oh, excuse me. No, no, it's okay. Don't, <laughs> don't fall. Uh, we're going to take a very quick break. Where. It's normally a longer break, but we're going to take a quick one because we're running a bit late. But uh, stay here. The best is yet to come. Tomas Diaz is going to talk about um, uh, disruption and alignment in work and education. So more to come. Hang around. You can network, talk amongst yourselves, and we'll start again in 10 minutes. Thank you. So are you all feeling good about the future of your work? Anybody feeling good about it? 
Anybody worried? Who's worried? Really? Why, tell me why you're worried. Just a couple comments quickly. Why are you worried about your future? The future of your work, I mean. You raised your hand. Ah, yeah. I've been looking recently at Christopher Pound from Market AAD, looking at artificial intelligence. Right now there's a skills shortage, but in 10 years time, 20 years time, my background is marketing. Artificial intelligence will replace people, I think, who are working in marketing. So mm -hmm. that's the sort of uh, thing that worries me about the future, artificial yes. intelligence. Yeah, well, that's, that's a good point. I'm a marketer too, and I think, I mean, aren't these skills about selling our ideas and persuading people to do things, isn't that still gonna be a human thing? Well, maybe not. Who else is nervous about their work, the future of their work? Hi, come on up and use that mic, please. Tell us where you're from. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm here, I'm from here, I'm from Barcelona, and I'm tr actually I'm, I'm also a marketeer teaching in a business school. And one of my mo worries is that I s see and foresee a gap that is getting bigger between what we do in the business school and the skills that are or may be needed in the yeah. future. Yeah, that's, and, and I think Tomas and his panel will talk about that today. You know, what, what we're studying, what we're learning today, how does that need to change for the future? So it is my pleasure to introduce our panel. Uh, Tomas Diaz is uh, the founder and co-director of Fab Lab Barcelona. He told me uh, this morning that there used to be eight and now there are 2,000. So there are fab labs all over the world, and I think he will be talking about disruption and what's changing and what, what needs to change. And Tomas will introduce his uh, great panel. So please, welcome Tomas Diaz. Thank you. Hola. Okay, hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining our, our discussion today. Uh, as has been said, I'm the director of, uh, of Fabla Barcelona which is located inside the Institute for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia. But I, I wear also some other different hats. Uh, you know, we have 2,000 labs in the world, means that spaces like at this big, um, they are equipped with digital fabrication machines, which allows people to turn digital information into, into atoms, to turn bits into atoms, but also atoms into bits. This is a fundamental change because we are talking about the capability to share atoms through the internet, meaning that if there is a fab lab in Cape Town or in Lima in Peru, and they have a similar equipment that the fab lab in Barcelona, I can send the design of a chair, of a house, of shoes, of a mobile phone, without having to ship the atoms in a shipping container or using fossil fuels. So we're talking about maybe something slightly in a, the opposite direction that Victor was saying, like a, going to intang intangibles. Um, I think we're trying to make tangibles back and all what it means uh, you know, to take care of the things that we create, uh, to get the knowledge of how we create those things and how they help us to improve our lives in cities. If we don't know how things are made, then we're basically really on the disposal of any other agent that make things for us. And that's what has been happening for the last 200 years. Um, one of my hats uh, is to promote uh, the work of Fab Labs, but not in relation with technology, but actually in their impact in how to transform cities to become more productive, to address two main challenges of our time, the ecological one and the social one, meaning uh, change our productive system that is extractive to a more circular one, uh, and also giving more uh, skills and tools for people to be more resilient and more capable to create their own tools, to create their own technologies, and to make more productive and sustainable communities. Uh, this is real work we are, we are doing with more than 33 governments in the world on, at the city level. Uh, and now that's part of what we call the Fab City Global Initiative. I have another hat, <laughs> which is uh, I'm directing a master program inside IAAC called the Master in Design for Emerging Futures. So we're trying to look on what is the 21st century education for actually for the future of work, if we can still talk about work and jobs in the future. So one of the first things that we challenge is actually the very, you know, when, when people ask us, um, what is the uh, professional opportunities of this master, for instance? The first one I would say is like, uh, we want to help you to not thinking about someone else to employ you only but actually to be someone that can create empro employment for others as well. 
So someone that can provide opportunities, someone that can take risks. And I was talking before about the risk taking. I think that there is a, maybe a 1% of the world, or maybe a 10% of the world, that they can take risk. But the, what we have to change is the type of risks that we take. We are not talking about taking risks uh, for the generation of maximum profits, but actually taking, ri uh, taking risks to build more inclusive and more ecological models for our society to work, right? And I think that's the kind of a risk takers that we need to train and we need to look into the future, right? Just uh, as a short introduction to the panel, I want to also make a reflection about uh, the Smart City Expo itself. <laughs> Uh, you know, nothing personal, but I have been coming for all the editions of the Smart City Expo. Mostly, maybe I skipped one, but I came the first one. Um, and somehow, when I woke up, you know, when I woke up this uh, every morning this week, and I was checking the tweets that people were talking and putting the hashtag of the Smart City Expo 2019, it felt like a very 2009. It felt it felt like a very 2012. Uh, it seems that it's kind of a you are we are coming here to go back to the past in a way. We're talking about still public private partnership is crucial for the future of cities. Like uh, really? 2019. The other thing that is very worrying for me is that we have seen um, and especially uh, you know I recommend to look at a short article that my friend Boyd Cohen has wrote has written about the smart cities and he was take, talking about three models of smart cities. The 1.0 was the smart city that we saw in the first, let's say, four or five editions of the Smart City Expo. It was pushed by government, especially pushed by companies with the support of governments, right? So we've been technology push, solutions push. The 2.0 was the smart city pushed by governments, mainly strategies, selling strategies somehow. And the 3.0 was supposed to be the smart city of the citizens. So there were some predictions I remember like a two or three years ago that in the future Smart City Expo, the expo will be produced by the citizens of Barcelona, or it will be in the city of Barcelona and not in the outskirts locked in into a room. What is very concerning is that we are looking not at the Smart City Expo today, we're looking like at the Smart Country Expo. And that's totally opposite to the idea of giving power to cities. You know, the power of nation states is actually part of the 19th and 20th century. The 21st century should be the century of the cities. And it's very, very, if, if you're not worried, you should be uh, when you walk around the expo and see the pavilions of countries, be aware that, you know, the maniacs that we have in position of leading countries now are putting in risk the futures of our own cities. So in order to change that, we need to think about uh, differently of how we are going to teach, train people, how, to, how we can create environments for learning. I think that it's more important also to think about that, not to Think about educating people that is uneducated, because that's something also very colonial. But it's thinking about creating spaces to learn, right? Learning, learning spaces. And that's something that is quite needed today in our cities, in our institutions, academic or not, and even in our companies. So today, we're going to be learning from different experiences, uh, from the educational sector, uh, also from the government sector, and also from the company sector. Uh, I will stop here my short introduction. I, will, I want to welcome uh, our panel. Uh, please, Daniela Garcia, head of recruitment, recruitment uh, from FCC. Um, Cristina Mateo, uh, associate dean of the IE School of Architecture and Design. And then uh, Taisuke Matsusaki, uh, ICT collaboration uh, responsible of the Kobe City in Japan. Give them a warm applause, please. And welcome to the panel. So the way our panel is going to work uh, is uh, we're going to have a short presentation from each one of our, our, of our guests. And then we're going to open up for discussions in which, of course, you can participate. I will try to trigger some questions. And we'll try to be provoking, as you can see, and a little bit critical as well. Don't worry. Uh, I will be gentle. So I think that we start with uh, Daniela. Uh, if we can put the presentation of uh, Daniela, please. Um, and if you prefer uh, to stand or present from here? No, it's OK. From you prefer to present from here? Yeah, okay. of course. So. Can you hear me well, everyone? OK. No, okay. So this is not rocket science. OK. It's forward, like, yeah. Perfect. <laughs> cool. So good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for being here. And thanks also for your invitation. 
Uh, as Thomas said, I'm Daniela Garcia, and I'm the head of the recruitment of FCC Environment. So today, I'm going to talk about um, how FCC Environment uh, is facing these um, changing and demanding challenges about uh, future employment or about how we um, make or we, how can we increase our workforce through diversity, okay? So these are uh, the topics that I will going to uh, share with you. First of all, I want to introduce you to FCC environment. It's important that you um, notice that FCC is a group and we have four business lines. I came today from FCC environment, okay? Uh, I will share also uh, how is our employment philosophy then I will share with you some of our examples of how we are committed to diversity and inclusion. And um, to finish, I will show you a short video of who we are, okay? So first of all, who we are. We are environment. Um, we exist since 1911. Uh, we are almost uh, more than 31,000 employees. Uh, we are uh, the number one in the industry in Spain, and we are part of the top seven in the world. And we have national prisons. We are um, in more than 33,000, 30, sorry, th um, in, in Spanish municipals, and we are in more than 10 countries in the world. So these are our services. We have waste collection, maintenance of green spaces, um, cleaning and maintenance of buildings and facilities, street cleaning, urban waste treatment and recycling, so as well industrial waste treatment and recycling, recovery of contaminated soils, and maintenance of several networks. As you can see, we have environment services. And if we don't take care about the environment, we won't be able to open a new business or even a new industry. That's why we take, up, take, our, we take care about of our people. So, how FCC is committed to the diversity and inclusion movement? We, um, foc we are focused in th this all, all of these characteristics. First of all, we want to um, create local employment. Why? Because um, we want to bring work to people. We are adjusting and adapting the requirements need to people so they can be able to go to work and also so they can see work as a um, tool, not as an obstacle. Then quality and worthy employment because we know that we spend many of our time at work, so we want to make a life and work balance, and we want to adapt uh, people's requirements to, the, to their jobs so they can see um, the value they are apporting to our business. Uh, social integration, because as um, other speakers said before, we are living in a volatile world, so we need to adapt our workforce. And we want to measure our growth through um, comparing the market needs with the sustainable development goals. These are some, of our exam some examples of how FCC environment is increasing uh, our workforce, the diversity in our workforce. For example, we have uh, policies and organizational values. Then we have a lot of alliances uh, with insertion entities. And we have a an special and a big advantage of our training programs because we really work hard in um, adapting training programs and special uh, skills to the people and to the organization. These are, on the right side of the slide, you can see uh, our group of people that we have in our workforce. We really work hard 
in making strong and stressful um, diversity in our organization. And in the right, left side of, of this slide, you can see many of our alliances. As you can see, we have uh, many alliances with universities, with um, liberal in, in insertion um, social entities, sorry. And uh, we have our own um, central specialized employee center, okay? These are some of our achievements related with uh, sustainable goals. For example, with number five, uh, we work hard to promote gender equality. As you can see, the most important of this slide, we are increasing the woman workforce and we really work hard in our equal uh, plan. Related with uh, the objective number eight of sustainability, uh, we are transforming and creating a lot of uh, contracts to uh, make people um, maintain uh, their jobs. And related with the objective number 10 is um, we really are increasing disabled people and people vulnerable of social risk in our workforce because we believe in their cap capabilities and in the that this uh, volatile world needs uh, to believe in the lot of people that we still existing. And I would like to say, according to the last objective, that we are proud that the last week we received an award from Incorporar La Caixa that we uh, lead the ranking of contracts in waste collection industry with disabled people. And to finish, I just want to show you a short video about who we are and about why we really are cared about uh, increased diversity in our workforce. Our planet faces unprecedented environmental challenges. Every action we take is important. We all have a fundamental role and an inescapable commitment to the environment. At FCC, we are aware of this and play our part always at the service of the citizen. By 2030, the global population will exceed eight and a half billion people. Cities are growing every day and they need new services that improve people's quality of life. You like your city and you take care of it. We're here to help you so that you can enjoy it. Waste is a serious problem. When you recycle, we're at your side, anywhere in the world, at any time of day, recycling with you. There are over 748 million people without access to safe drinking water. When you turn off the tap, you reduce your consumption and avoid carbon dioxide emissions. When you use LEDs, you reduce your carbon footprint. Responsible behavior towards the environment is vital for our planet. With one action, you can transform the world. The planet counts on you, and you count on us. So just to finish uh, my presentation, I would like to show you a little uh, of who we are. And as you can see, we work in permanent services on time. That's why we really believe that we need a strong workforce uh, working with us. And that's why we really take care about diversity. And that's all. Thank you, Daniela. Thank you. OK, uh, we go then with uh, Taisuke, uh, please, Taisuke-san. OK. Uh, please, the presentation. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Taisuke Matsuke from Kobe City, Japan. And I'd like to uh, show you the, just the experimental uh, level so, so far, so, 
but I'd like to uh, show you some trial in a school for data, uh, uh, data literacy education in Kobe. Next, please. Ah, so ka. Which one? Oh? Yeah. Oh. Should With not the forward, the forward. Yeah. Yeah. That one. Uh, I come from a Kobe city, as I mentioned. I, I think uh, the very important uh, to promote uh, such a, a digital, uh, digital economy or digital education with some uh, company uh, and or use university because we, that's why we uh, promote the public, uh, public private partnership with local community or uh, university and industry. So we implement uh, such a trial levels of a data academy or curriculum in a uh, university or a high school and some other uh, experiment uh, for to innovate uh, education. For I, I'll show you the case one. Uh, this is a smart running project in municipal high school. And uh, the, we, we emphasize that uh, even uh, today, the university student level uh, uh, learns a lot of data uh, literacy. But uh, on the other side, the uh, high school level is not. So that's why we realize uh, how, how, uh, how important the uh, younger generation, the, uh, under the, uh, for example, under the 18 years old is very important. So we implemented this experiment in, in high school. So our title is Data Analysis for Students by the Student Shall Accelerate Athletic Ability. And this was supported by the uh, NTT Docomo. This, uh, this, uh, this is uh, one, of the, one of the largest telecommunication company and ASICS. ASICS is a famous uh, sports gear, you know, uh, on its line. But they have uh, uh, they located the headquarters in the Kobe city. That's why they support us. The experiment uh, show you like our flow is like this, and uh, basically, athlete, sports athlete in high school just running around the uh, around the school building. Even if he is a football player or sometimes a baseball player, basketball player, same menu they have. That means jog, jogging around the high, uh, high school building. But people, uh, student, some students began to realize that it's not effective for each player because uh, every player has a different role on the game, like a football. You can see. You can't see. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry. For example, for, uh, this is a football uh, example. Forward and midfielder and defender running very different uh, uh, trails. So they, uh, they, put, uh, they put a Bluetooth, or Bluetooth tag on the shoes and running and uh, make uh, their uh, heart, heart stroke, heartbeat stroke, or running speed, or everything gathering with uh, this. This, uh, uh, this device and uh, collecting the data for each uh, in person. Uh, this is a boy. They, they are, uh, they are, <laughs> they are uh, this time the uh, a promo, uh, study reader, you know. And uh, yeah, so they realize uh, midfield, for, for example, the left, left is uh, uh, forward. Forward speed and uh, mid uh, midfielder speed is on running training level is different. So they change uh, they change the menu with uh, uh, red line is dash and the yellow line is just a jogging. And for example, defender is uh, they are also uh, moving uh, like a zigzag you mentioned, like like zigzag. So the trace is very different. So. That's the way uh, we change, they change the menu according to the data analysis. And they also learn the visualization for that data. It's a very simple though, uh, primitive level though, but it, they realize how important the data is. 
And so we began to, we began to realize that uh, data utilization education is very important for each. For, each. For, for example, for students, skill up. And uh, for other things, if the problem is uh, to solve the problem, that means that athlete, athlete, uh, athlete, le uh, athlete level um, is going up, that means uh, of they can get, they can learn faster for in person, and the other things uh, other data uh, running data is stored store, store, stored many times in, in school. There there isn't they never have have it, but this time they store the data sports data to analysis. And the supported company ASICS is also created and uh, soon will be launched a new. Uh, uh, such an analysis system for students. Actually, in Japan, we have a professional sports data analysis device already launched in the market, but in a, uh, in a school level, especially high school level or junior high school level, we don't have it. Mm. So that's why the uh, ASICs are for focused to launch a, a new service. So everyone's so happy. So the other case is uh, uh, just, uh, just held yesterday. Uh, the collaboration with the Barcelona City on the data literacy education. You know, we have, we have been a long time relationship or over 25 years of the sister city relationship. And uh, Barcelona City has a contest to data analysis for, uh, for, for young children, a uh, young student. And we also have the same, uh, same event uh, was held from um, 2016. And that, that was uh, to visualize, uh, to, social, to, to solve the social rights with a visualization, sorry. So that was held, and so we joined together and like this uh, under, the, under the photo. And we joined, we joined a contest or a school or a workshop from now on will be held, will be held every year. So, and this time, uh, this time workshop, I, we took uh, some high school student to uh, this school uh, in Barcelona City, IVS Gracia de, Gracia de uh, Grand, uh, Gracia Barcelona. It's, it's a high school student, but they also, they are, uh, those, those uh, Barcelona boys and girls are uh, winner of the, that contest. And we also send, uh, we also send our, our side of student is uh, maybe one of the best performance in, in high school. So we, uh, we meet them together and they make a re good relationship to solve the data using uh, open data like a uh, city data or bo both city. And my conclusion is finally that such a uh, data analysis education makes a new eco ecosystem with, uh, uh, with a various organization, including a company or a university or a local authority. And that, that makes a human resource development, I think, we, we believe. That's why we have to focus, uh, focus the education level, uh, not only, uh, not only uh, programming skill, but also data analysis skill or feeling, mm -hmm. including a uh, design thinking. That is very important. To, so, every, so we can share the any anywhere. Uh, for example, including a Barcelona city or other city, we can uh, exchange knowledge and experience about that. That's a, that's a reason we uh, focus uh, focus uh, data uh, data literacy education. Absolutely. That's, uh, my, that is my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's okay. Um, then we're going to go with Christina. Uh, and after, we're going to open up for a uh, discussion. Christina? I'll stand up if that's okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, okay. So um, thanks uh, um, for being here, listening to this interesting uh, session. I'm going to be challenge you a little bit and give you a, a bit of context and challenge you because that's the kind of uh, challenge that we face every day uh, working in the education sector. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the case of I School of Architecture and Design in relation to how we actually train people to be the challengers of what we are having right now. So to put some quick context, 
we are having um, four big, big kind of uh, challenges, basically. The demographic and social challenges, the rapid um, urbanization, climate change, and of course, the technological breakthroughs. I'm going to talk very quickly, uh, but, but mostly the photos are going to be talking for themselves. So we have a contradiction now. We have um, um, people who are actually aging, and we have uh, the longest kind of uh, periods of, uh, of life that we've ever had. Average age in a city like Madrid, where I live, is actually 85 years old um, of, of, of age. So that's, that's incredible. But at the same time, there is a falling infertility in most of the Western countries. So that presents challenges. The other thing is that the, the process of urbanization is actually concentrating in developing countries. Again, this for people who are actually in the field of architecture and design, which is the field I am in, uh, is crucial. And of course, we are just having uh, this right now. Uh, this is a photo of Venice uh, of a few days ago. Um, you know, clearly we are facing climate change, and this could be just one of the, the small kind of uh, uh, evidence. Um, and the last and the most perhaps uh, evident kind of challenge that we have now is, is the digital challenge. The, the fact that everything is becoming rapidly transformed through digitalization. But that's actually changing mostly how we actually work, how we live. And of course, I want to present you quickly with this notion, the workspace city, because this is actually something which is the kind of space um, conceptually speaking, where we are actually all dealing with those challenges that I mentioned before, which is basically a city or a space where, which is dynamic and enthusiastic, of course, but at the same time, which is actually having this sort of notion of contingent works. We are all engaged in work partially or as a freelance or maybe, um, you know, different things at different times. It's a city which is connected but at the same time with a lot of attention deficit. It's a city which is out and about, but we are more isolated than ever in that city. It's diverse, but not for everyone. So this is the kind of concept, uh, if you want, that I'm actually presenting. Um, it's actually um, the, the myriad of all challenges that we currently have. Some data, I'm not going to go into the details. You have it there. But basically, this is talking about how you know, generations, we were talking before in, a, in, a, in another presentation, how generations now are actually co co coexisting in the workplace, how we have maybe five generations, but how that, that difference of generations actually have different requirements. Um, the millennials maybe look for work more often than the baby boomers. So what does that mean? At the same time, um, the contingent kind of worker is a reality. The engagement that we have in terms of loyalty, but also in terms of opportunities, is different when we face work. And work means different things for different people. And of course, we are always looking at our mobiles. We all are looking. You are all looking at your mobiles right now. Um, but in fact, people actually, even in the UK, are looking at the mobiles while they are actually sleeping. So they wake up and look at the mobile. So it's, it's becoming actually a reason to wake up, which is incredible. Um, so with all this, that there is no difference between work and life, private and public, and all these challenges, yes, this is a, a volatile and rapid changing context, and this is where I think that architects and designers are require, require more than ever, because they are the choreographers of daily life, of that workspace city that I was talking about. These are just some sort of uh, first pages, cover pages, or different publications that talk really about the fear that architects and designers are experiencing right now. And by that, I can mention any other profession, but I'm talking about architects and designers. They are worried about what's going to happen with their jobs. Are they going to be outed by robots or by some sort of uh, digital machine? And in the face of that, we've been talking here about how important there are some skills that are irreplaceable. Um, it's interesting that about three, four years ago, uh, a publication like FASCO was already talking about how the CEO of the future was a designer in chief. Okay? So that was important. At the same time, in the face of uh, digitalization, there are new jobs, new opportunities such as those which are actually appearing. And sometimes we don't really know what the jobs of the future are going to be, 
but they, those jobs are actually starting to be the jobs of the present. So we need to kind of be quickly adapting to that. Interestingly as well, Bloomberg um, Business Week, which is a very much business conscious uh, magazine, publication, already was uh, addressing the issue of the design, the importance of design. So training in design, training in, in design professions is becoming a key element to be able to, uh, to face the challenges of the future. So what will we do in I School of Architecture and Design without selling my book? Um, I'll just tell you what I think that is important in relation to the challenges that we've been talking about. We are based in Madrid, but we're an international institution. We have a ratio of students, which is basically nearly 80% of our students are international, but also we have a great gender diversity in our students and also in our faculty. That's key for the things that we've been talking about. We practice a culture of making, so it's a hands-on learning. People actually learn by doing. Um, of course, uh, Tomás has been talking about the Fab Lab, the role of Fab Labs, fabrication labs, as uh, some sort of uh, cohesive uh, areas where people actually can socialize, but also can learn from each other and learn hands-on. A culture of sustainability. We all talk about sustainability, but we need to also talk and do and teach what it is, how to make it tangible. Um, and that's, that's what we are at the moment doing. Um, so we have uh, projects where this has to be uh, parameterized, so people have to actually demonstrate what it is that they are doing towards sustainability, cradle-to-cradle -cradle projects, use of materials, um, and, and so on. Um, a culture of exchange, so we do actually um, um, promote exchanges with institutions, with other institutions, but also with the industry, with partners, with, the, with, the, with governments, but also with the private sector. And a culture of engagement by uh, uh, basically working with the community, the local community. So students who may not be from that particular place actually get to learn more about the day-to-day -day and the challenges that the people that they live next to them actually are facing. So we have the labs where people are actually working with uh, projects from the city council. Um, this uh, is uh, like the um, rehabilitation of a library. Um, I won't get into much of this, some examples of um, how students learn from each other, how they exhibit their work so they actually can uh, talk about what they are doing with others and have that sort of culture of exchange that I was talking about. And very important, work in partnership with, with the private sector, with companies, which are telling us what it is that is actually required in terms of the, of, of the work requirements. We need to have that sort of dialogue. Um, and also to think that uh, our students actually go to work in uh, uh, positions that are not necessarily the traditionally understood uh, an architect maybe would do. Some of them are actually working as architects, of course, but others are actually working as computational designers, which are, is maybe like a, a, new, a new job, um, or lighting designers. So this is like actually a, way, a, more, a broader way of understanding the job of architects and designers. Um, as I said, you know, exchanges with other institutions, very important to learn from each other. Um, do work beyond the classes. The class is a space, but the, the, the kind of the city is the, the biggest space. Uh, out, being out there, learning, uh, learning by doing in the city with people, and collaborating with companies which work in a, in a range of different sectors. That's, that's really important. Also by recognized speakers, internationally recognized speakers who are not only architects or, design, or designers, but they are actually coming from other types of industries. Um, and participating in events which are of international recognition, having this type of dialogue like the one that we are having here today. So being all over, bringing people, and that's basically what I think that is key for the jobs of the future and how we are doing it in High School of Architecture and Design. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Christina. Well, I, I think that we have like a uh, really interesting and complementary three perspectives from the future of work. Uh, if I might say just slightly three things. Um, uh, one is that, and also to provoke a little bit the questions and so on, one is that, um, you know, first of all, like a Daniela for the work of, uh, of FCC, uh, it's interesting because from the video, I learned that there will be a lot of automated work in one hand that is going to remove some of the existing jobs uh, thanks to the, the support and the, pro the provision of services that, that FCC do, uh, does in one hand. 
In the other hand, I see that they, you know, there are some jobs that actually we want to give away, right? Somehow, like, uh, you know, and what I'm talking about is not having human picking up your trash. That's what I'm saying. Uh, and then, and again, I guess like here, the, the, the elephant in the room for all of us is, is automation. No? So I, I would like to pick up like at the automation part and then probably make it transversal. Um, from uh, Taisuke, uh, I think that you know, you, you know, if we can think about FCC as a provider and all the risks that it uh, implies in relation to, to jobs, I think that a city is an enabler, no, in a way. Uh, mm -hmm. And then uh, as an enabler, you have uh, somehow promoted, you know, through a, a very specific example, um, how bringing you know, newer generations to get engaged uh, to the use of, uh, of data, uh, first of all. And I think that that's something that the late data literacy is, is quite fundamental. But also, we're going to see that that's going to get more complex when, again, like, uh, you know, we introduce a different level of intelligence, uh, when it's not only analyzing data, but also analyzing data together with another level of intelligence that we are, uh, we are uh, starting to play with. And then finally, Christina, I, uh, you know, as an art, you know, we share somehow the, the mission of uh, being part of architecture, uh, of schools of design and architecture. Um, I, I feel a lot uh, your work, and I think that uh, somehow it's connected to what we do. Um, I can think, I can see that you know our role maybe is more like a being a provoker, right? Somehow like uh, triggering, triggering uh, you know new mindsets and, and somehow challenging uh, the new the new uh, again workforce. But again, actually, I think like uh, it's better to think about the new leadership. So that's my takeaway in the you know from the three from the three presentations. Um, um, I don't want to start with questions I have, but uh, I would suggest that some of you launch the first question. I, you know, again, the elephant in the room is automation, AI, robots. Uh, please uh, take the microphone and, and throw the first one. Who is the? Can you, you? Yeah, please. Hi there. Uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm a university student, university student right now, currently studying urban planning and public policy. And Where? The, Sorry, Jonathan. Oh, uh, I'm from, uh, I go to school at, at DePaul University. It's in the United States. Okay. I'm doing currently an exchange program in the University of Copenhagen. Okay. And one of the things I wanted to ask the panel is, as automation right, is this increasing pressing issue that's involving in many right, developed countries, are we thinking about maybe policies about post-work? Are we thinking about maybe a post-work uh, force where, let's say, for example, do people, do all people have to get an education? Do all people have to strive to work for a career? Or will there start to be right this new idea of now people really don't need to work, essentially? If there's going to be so many processes um, allowing us to basically live life through automation, essentially. But what, what's your you know, take on that? I can start. Um, yeah, I think that, I think that uh, we are, I mean, things are changing very fast, and we had to kind of uh, uh, realize that maybe the, the old pattern of work, uh, sorry, study, work, retire, uh, is no longer valid. Um, or maybe it is still, but for some, but for most of us, it's not, not really valid. So I think that the notion of life, um, lifelong learning, um, that's, what, that's one crucial element to, to be constantly training ourselves to be adapted to change. That's one, one thing. And I don't know about, uh, you know, not post-work, post -work, what, what's, what's that? But uh, because I, I think that we are going to be working more, but differently. So that's my take. But, but I think it relates with the use of time, right? So you also, if you think about like, uh, how industrial society organized uh, human activity, which there are actually impacted cities at the end, is it this very clear separation in the eight by three, right? Eight hours of work, eight hours of rest, eight hours of entertainment, right? And that was possible because, again, we have all the tools in order to create that. But uh, I think it's like this more liquid, you know? Totally. There's more liqui liquidity, which also translates into the, into the cities itself, right? Yeah. So wh what do you think is the alternative from the uh, eight times three uh, in, a, you know, in the near future? Or actually, we're starting to see it, no? I think that is is 24/7 work, <laughs> but work in a fun way. So that's uh, that's um, that's what I think. Okay. Uh, what, what about you, Daniela? Yeah. Okay. So I can say that it's an interesting question as well. Um, but I can say that we must work hard in spreading this kind of culture, first of all, 
and to make a big and stronger and strong analyze about the job positions, about um, what do we need in the market and what other positions are or can be and maybe supplied with another one. It's an interesting analyze. Taisuke, uh, add something? Yeah, just my pro, uh, uh, suggestion though. Uh, I, I, I've been teaching uh, uh, a couple of years for data science in university and uh, they are very expert about uh, uh, technology, you know, but they don't know how the society is going on, what is a uh, problem on the society. That's why we should, uh, they should know or the news or what's going on on, on, a, on a planet or regional area. That's important, I think. Mm -hmm. This you. is my suggestion to you. No, I, de I definitely, I think like, uh, I go for the 24 seven phone work, uh, to mm -hmm. be honest. Uh, uh, you know, this, I was mentioning at the beginning, no, this idea of thinking on studying something for finally waiting for someone to pick you up because what you studied, mm -hmm. and then you showing your diploma, you did great, and you got amazing grades, and you screw up in the, inter yeah. the job interview, you don't get the job. Uh, it's, but also, I think that we should not go to the other, I think, narrative, which is everybody's an entrepreneur, and they can take care of their own life. So, I think that you know, we still need to think about the supportive systems. I think they were discussed before with Lina and also in the questions of Almudena. No? Uh, please, another question here. Uh, introduce yourself, where are you from, your name? Yeah, hi, I'm Jukka Tuominen from the city of Helsinki. And, and like it continues to the uh, previous question, I, I loved Christina's answer to that, but uh, what about an idea that uh, if you don't only have like a lifelong learning but if you could have a kind of a uh, lifelong childhood or lifelong mm. retirement, <laughs> mm -hmm. because you need to stop the childhood at some point, and after uh, studying and, and working, then you get to really live your life. But, but if you could have a, a parts of childhood continue throughout your life, as well as the retirement parts, things that you would love to do, but only need to push it once you retire. Do you have any ideas about that? That's a very philosophical uh, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> sort of, yeah. Um, I don't think that necessarily learning means, uh, or sort of lifelong learning means uh, anything to be related to being a child. I think that, uh, um, and we can talk about what, what it means to be a child, but uh, that's a different kind of panel. I think that uh, lifelong learning is something that we are already having to do. We are doing it, and I think that it's also related to what Thomas was saying about the fluidity of, of spaces, or what learning spaces are, or what working spaces are as well. We are here maybe working as well as learning, and, and, and as well as entertaining. So I think that that fluidity is what maybe is making us more, child, more children than ever. Yeah. So. I, I would like to add something, but for me it's a, it's, it's a very, it's, it's risky. In one way, because uh, you know, when you put child uh, with access to a button that activates a nuclear uh, attack of a country, as we have now, it's quite. It, we need to be careful about it. So we have a lot of child taking care of uh, of our destiny, and and it's dangerous when they are playing, you know, boy games um, with the lives of uh, the rest of uh, humanity. Um, a question? Yeah, amazing, Sandra. Sort of a question for all of you as well, but how many of you think that, that your life has meaning because of your work? And how many of you think your life has meaning because of your family and your social? Oh, that as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's like, where is the purpose in our lives, you know? And, and if it changes that we don't need to work 40 hours a week, in the United States that's the norm, then what do you do with that time? And how do you still feel like you're contributing and being a part of a community? I mean, I, I think that's really at the heart of the difficult question for where we're going <clears throat> in the future. It, it'll be interesting for all of you to shape that. But I, you all may have some comments. Yeah, I, 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 you know, I, I'd, I'd <laughs> love to add a, a small comment to that, which is, yeah, we are part of a very a small group in relationship with the rest of percentage of the world in which I think, I think the majority we are you know, we have access to water, internet, <coughs> education. So that makes us like a barely the 10% of the entire world population. Yes. 
And then when you have that covered, then you can make choices. And then you can think about your purpose. But uh, when you are, as your math was showing, you know, the, the urbanization is going towards, uh, to, it's going to happen in countries in which the purpose is to survive, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's, that's you know, something that to consider as well, because there's, there's <coughs> no choices to be made there. Uh, we are an elite, and we have the choice, we have the, the, the luxury to take in choices. And I want to go back again to the idea of, of we, we are just, uh, you know, we have to take risks. Mm. But, and, and, and there is no question about that. The, risks, the kind of risks we have to take is actually to be able to build a more inclusive uh, world no? somehow. So we have to finish, but I'm going to steal some time to give you, if you have some closing comments, please. Uh, 30 seconds, each one of you, okay. and we close it. Daniela? Yeah. Okay. I just want to add to your question that uh, there's stu uh, many studies that show us that we must invest in um, social and in digital skills. Okay. So I think it's um, interesting to read about um, how we can make innovative solutions to implement digital and social skills. Digital and social skills. <coughs> Uh, Christina? I would say that there has never been a, a more exciting time to live than now, and um, lifelong learning is, is good. Cool. Lifelong learning, and that's okay. Yeah, it's important to uh, let, the, <coughs> let the young generation to, uh, to face, face uh, many problems around you, and your life is very important to solve the, with the data or the skills. I think this is my opinion. Power to the young. So I think that with that, we finish. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, the panelists. Thank you. Thank you for hosting us, Sandra.